Hello, how you guys doing? James here. I'm going to do a series of videos and uh, uh, I'm going to go to a, one of my, this is my cheap editing version, of course, doing always do the laptop. One of these days I'll have to get me a, some software actually you can, right now I'm not very good tech oriented, so I just got to do it the cheap version, just... <laughs> But you know, it's the cheap version of it, of editing the video. Hopefully you can see. Well, I'm going to show you a couple of videos that are going to lead, lead to a topic. And one, the videos going to narrate itself. And then I'll add my commentary afterwards. But I'm just going to be playing a series of videos, trying not to bore you with my, my commentary. But I'm here to give you the truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God, I can do the best thing I can from different platforms and I'm going to kind of put it together in, you know, my best version in Ohio or with the people. And I'm just going to use a little bit of their video and um, give you, you know, a good version of it. Okay. So bear with me. So let's start with... Uh, uh, let me see. I think I did this one. Hold on here. Let me see. Well, I'll tell you what. Let me hurry up and start the video because this, this timer is... Let me get back to this one. And I'll get to that one. Shout, shout out to his channel to uh, um, Black Cultural Diary. Shout out to his channel. But I'm going to use a little bit of his material. Why do we see a pattern of discrimination, suppression, and prejudice against black Africans? And even that pattern lingers to this day. What's the made up hostility the white European and Arabs felt toward black Africans? Historically speaking, it was due to the superiority the black Africans have had since the start of civilization. Black Africans were the richest of the rich, living in gold cities and making the world jealous. That's where non-black people, with an inferiority complex, decided to portray black Africans as inferior. But how? Well, it was done by using their dark complexion, plump lips, and woolly hair. Yes, they felt a threat so striking that they declared black Africans a backward, inferior race. All their struggle was to show how uncivilized black Africans were so they could teach them how civilized people like them live. That's where the wicked journey against black Africans started. Today, even if everyone stays silent, history speaks too loud to be avoided. But the real focus should be this question. Why do non-blacks see black Africans as a threat? And why does this same feeling prevail even today? Welcome to a new episode of Black Culture Diary, a channel where we talk about the people that are evidently ancestors of and superior to everyone, the black. We scrutinize history here to bring the black culture back on the surface again. In this episode, we will debunk why black Africans were historically viewed as a threat. Let's get started. The first reason why non-black felt threatened was black Africans' physical superiority. Historically, and even today, black people are the strongest humans on earth. And this strength manifests itself in their physical charisma, which is hidden from nobody. Non-blacks knew if blacks were allowed to participate in their matters, they would eventually dominate what they held dear. Therefore, blacks were left in the whirlpool of a new fabricated system. Non-blacks, like the European colonizer, made it a social culture to enslave blacks. Since they couldn't compete with blacks in terms of strength, doing physical work was deemed inferior. Instead, Someone who could do sophisticated jobs was considered civilized, and these civilized were then seen fit to be kings and rulers. Simply, blacks were pulled out of the power equation. You see, non-black changed the system which graded people. Physical superiority was deemed inferior as compared to being delicate and fragile, which was considered superior. Since European colonizers were weak and delicate themselves, they propagated this as a sign of delicacy. In the writing of Greek philosophers like Aristotle, it could be seen that he considered slaves as people born to be subjected. And don't forget, most enslaved people were black in those days. Aristotle said that these slaves should work for their Greek masters so the masters could have leisure. 
Without any hesitation, black people were considered lesser. Even different and brutal punishments were made for black slaves because it was considered that enslaved people were less sensitive to pain. This takes us to the second reason for the threat, which is genetic annihilation. You see, since black were enslaved, they were ripped off all of their basic rights. However, the brutal masters still felt threatened for obvious reasons of black supremacy. Black people were undoubtedly stronger, more charismatic, and bolder than the non-black masters. Hence, the threat of getting genetic annihilation existed. In other words, white Europeans and non-blacks knew that if they married black, their genes would become submissive and eventually extinct. Biologically, those genes with more chances of survival dominate during fusion and manifestation. Mating results in the fusion of genes that came from the male and female, and the child and its appearance is the manifestation of the dominant genes. In this case, no matter who married a black man, either a white or Arab woman, the genes of that black man would dominate. In other words, it will be the annihilation of non-blacks genes. Honestly, this was a massive threat, which cannot be emphasized enough. That's why black slaves were prohibited from marrying any non-black people. They knew the natural law of the survival of the fittest, which makes blacks superior to all. The non-blacks were so terrified of blacks that they followed the black blood drop strategy. Anyone with even one drop of black blood was considered inferior, taken away from normal people and put in the same class as other black people. But evidence exists that this wasn't the case in Latin America, where the Spanish and Portuguese empires existed. Spanish and Portuguese people would marry their slaves and have children, which could enjoy all the rights. Even Arabs would marry their black slaves and have children, which would introduce themselves as Arabs, following Arab culture and customs. Before we continue further, tell us, are you loving the video? If yes, please like and share the video and subscribe to our channel to watch more videos on black culture, it. history, civilization, and their natural superiority. True. Let's continue now. The third reason for the threat was black being the first ever human civilization. History and fossil records make it clear that the first humans emerged in Africa. No disparity exists on the point that it was Africa where the first humans started living. With time, they developed cognitive skills until reaching the point of building the first human civilization. It's just an unbelievable and rather unorthodox concept that black Africans existed and prospered when no other race was even born. Centuries of time encouraged some black Africans to migrate and come to Asia and Europe. Today, the people living in Asia, Europe, and all other parts of the world are actually predecessors of black Africans. And that's where non-black feel resented. They don't want to accept that they are predecessors of the same race they have been calling inferior for centuries. But honestly, it doesn't matter whether they accept it or not. Getting a DNA test would clear this all up. Already, this has been manifested. Genetic testing has shown that European people have 4% to 20% of their genes, similar to Northwest African ancestral groups. No matter which human you pick, they would have traces of African genes in them, manifesting that blacks are the actual ancestors of everyone. But non-blacks don't want that to happen. If it does, it will make Europeans similar to the black Africans of today, yep. breaking their illusion. Yep. Not only that, but this proves that Africa is actually the center of the world, not Europe or West, and that they hold all the power. Within a blink of an eye, black Africans will be added to the power equation, threatening non-blacks. The fourth striking reason for feeling a threat is due to Africa being the most resourceful continent on the planet. Natural resources like oil, gas, gold, silver, diamond, and other precious metals are overflowing in Africa. Mountains exist with gold under a few layers, which Africans often get their hands on, and non-blacks can't digest that. How can they fathom Africans having all the wealth? They cannot forget the phenomenal records of Africa's wealth in Arabic writing. In the writings of Arabs like Al-Fazari, it becomes evident how wealthy and prosperous Africa was centuries ago when the rest of the world didn't know what wealth was. Al-Fazari called Ghana the city of gold, and the king of Ghana the wealthiest sovereign alive. Knowing this, non-black cannot allow Africans of today to have all the resources. Hence, using the same stereotyping, Africans are shown as people with less cognitive power to decide about themselves. That's why European colonizers like France, Spain, Italy, and Britain colonized Africa and exploited its natural resources. Even today, France holds 50% of the African nation's gold in its vaults. Italy's Prime Minister, Georgia Maloney, revealed this in an interview. She said that in return for gold, 
France prints money for African nations, which are just pieces of paper worth nothing. Did you know these threats make non-blacks like white Europe and Asians hostile to black Africans? Do you feel that even after centuries, nothing has changed and non-blacks still subconsciously feel threatened? Tell us in the comment section right now. I did not prove him wrong when he said that they made this assessment on the skulls that he, he analyzed, over 700 of them. And in this source, he drew, he got a drawn out and all. Right? So going back to the 83rd book of Psalms, right? Again, it says here, they have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. Right? You and I. They said, come, let us cut them off from being a nation. That the name, in other words, when you understand the Hebrew word for name, is sham, means reputation. It also means literal name, but the reputation, their character. Let's, uh, let's cut them off from being a nation, land, family, and tongues. We was kidnapped. We was raptured. That's what rapture means, kidnapped, raped, murdered. Our identity taken from us repackaged that the name of Israel may may be no more in remembrance that we don't even know who we are and guess what and more and more people will start what piggybacking off of the delusion right you know being uh, as Jeremiah talks about well we inherited lies of our fathers not just referring to those other nations and talking about us too we inherited lies because even our many of our fathers were lost and brought on those lies and Harry and passed down lies. For they have consulted together with one consent, Akkad. They are confederate. Barayath against thee in the Israeli Bari. Right? So the Hebrew definition of confederate. It says here, confederacy, fetter, federate, covenant, league, alliance, pledge. So they are in what? Covenant. They are in what? Constitution, because Constitution is synonymous with Confederacy. It's synonymous to Covenant. It's synonymous to Alliance. It's synonymous to Pledge. It's synonymous as you, as, as when you look up the word Constitution. So they are in Covenant. You can also bring up the, the Spanish word Asiento. They are in Covenant with one another. Confederate means Covenant. So ten key kingdoms, right? The tenth letter of the Hebrew Alabayat is the Yad, which means redemption. That's the numerical value. So they're going to do everything to mess up with our redemption because they know that the Messiah said in Matthew chapter 15 that he did not come for no one else. He was not sent for no one else but the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So they want to do everything to manipulate what salvation is. They want to do everything to manipulate what redemption is. They want to do everything to manipulate among our community what love is what brother is, what family is. They want to manipulate us so bad that we start taking on their behaviors. They put a Messiah that looks like them, an image of this false Messiah that looks like them and force it on us. Ten kingdoms came together and created a covenant to destroy Israel. The battle for Africa, right? Because they're going to different parts of Africa. They're not just uh, uh, tearing up, trying to tear up Israel. They're doing it with the uh, Egyptians. They're doing it with everywhere we, we've gone to. You see that horse is following them, that black horse is following them, that uh, white horse is following Matter of fact, all, the, all these four horses is following us no matter where we go to the four corners of this earth. I, I proved that last week. So who are they? Now when we go to verse 6 through 8, it tells us the tabernacles of Edom, the Ishmaelites, Moab, Har uh, Hagar, Hagar, excuse me, Hagar, Hagarim, excuse me uh, for butchering the name, Gabal, Ammon, Amalek, the Philistines with the inhabitants of Tyre, Asher also is joined with them. They have hope in the children of Lot. So guess what? Again, not all these Caucasians are descendants of Edom. They're operating in the spirit of Edom. Esau's descendants studied Torah. Esau's descendants were allowed 
to go into the temple when you read the book of Maccabees and you know what he gets the things of the most high the, the king of Judah allowed them to dwell among them not all of them got absorbed into other nations there were still dark melanated Edomites but you also have like the Khazars they converted to Judaism which is the Edomites form of Torah that's that's them coming up with their Torah. Remember the Talmud, right? They have their own Talmud. They have their own interpretation of scriptures. All right? So all these 10 countries right here, these 10 groups here, right? These are, most of these are Israel, like uh, Israel, the Israelites' crazy cousins. But many of these countries are operating under the spirit of them. The Israelites, the Turks adopted, they took a heritage that's not theirs. Right? Anyway, so who is the bride of the serpent? Who is the bride of the serpent? This serpent is the culmination of these ten kingdoms. The serpent is Judaism. Their bride, Shekinah. Oh man, the queen of heaven. There's so many names for this Shekinah or whatever, or Shekinah. The Jewish community, as we know them, come to, they come to, uh, as we come to know, in the system that they have created, this mystical system, the Kabbalah, right? Uh, they have their own her, her, her hermaphroditic God. That, they, that is known as Einsoff, and their diagram of his body is called the Ten Sephira, right? So let me show you here. Let me show you a couple of clips here real quick. Family, we, done, we went through this here. We went through this. Let, let me show you here. Let me show you. Let me allow them to explain themselves. First, let me let this particular one, let me see if I have it, this rabbi explain to you what the Talmud is and what the Torah is without the Talmud. Matter of fact, no, I'm going to start off with the Ten Sephiroth, right? The Ein Sof, whom they serve. The Ten Sephiroth. One popular interpretation shows these characteristics as a map of God's body. Kabbalists believe that if they can understand God's anatomy, they can learn how his powers work. These ancient drawings reveal that God's body is similar to humans. The top symbolizes God's head, which is the source of will, wisdom, and understanding. Below that are symmetrically arranged organs and limbs, representing love, power, beauty, eternity, and splendor. The most unusual part of the diagram contains sensual imagery. The ninth part of God, called the foundation, is the phallus, or procreative life force of the universe. But according to the Sitharot, God also has female components. The final element, often called Shekinah, was depicted as the feminine half of God. So basically, they just describe God as wow. And that um, the feminine transgender God is what the Kabbalah most addresses. Right? It's referred to as the Shekhinah, the divine presence, and it's the feminine side of God, which is the side of God that's described as receptive. Sabbath, if it were not for the oral law, uh, we would not know uh, what the laws of, the dietary laws of Kashrut are, if it were not for the oral law, we would not know what the, the tefillin, what the boxes on our arms and heads that we wear every morning in our prayer service, what they're supposed to be, in fact, all of Judaism would be uh, completely mysterious, would be voodoo, if it were not for the 
This is how the Zohar interprets the opening words of Genesis. The Hebrew is Bereshit bara Elohim, which we usually translate in the beginning, God created. But the Zohar insists on reading the words in the precise order in which they appear in Hebrew. Bereshit, in the beginning, bara it created, Elohim, God. In the beginning, it created God. The Zohar takes that to mean, in the beginning, infinity created God. Now, what could that possibly mean? God is now the These object the of the people, verse, right? not the subject. Which sounds impossible or heretical, but the Zohar, I think, is saying that infinity is the true reality of God. Anything else that we call God is puny compared to that. That's our own imagination or our own our own estimate of what God could be. Well I'm gonna I'm gonna cut to a uh, cut clip, but I'm gonna show you who are the original why, how did they become the Libyans, the Egyptians, the Moroccans, some of Moroccans, the, some of the Arabic speaking, and how they connected to, to um, the Turks and the Arabs. And their language is similar, the Palestinians, the Le Le Lebanese, all centered around the Turks. Watch this, that today, in Egypt. But this is what the original, I'm sorry. Right here, Israel is sitting on the Haluaka Africa knee, which means that Israel is Northeast Africa. Uh, without question, we are in Northeast Africa. We are landlocked to Egypt, with the exception of the Suez Canal, which was a man made uh, ditch, a boundary now. Uh, between, in fact, it's not even really a boundary anymore since uh, Egypt has reclaimed the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, but nevertheless, even those of us who are Pan Africanists in our thinking and Afrocentric, we forget and we leave off that portion of Northeast Africa and, and, and don't want to claim anything beyond that. Europeans classified this area as the Middle East. You know, and then since this is the Middle East, the other question where the Middle West? Well, it's 
catch the period. Oh, well, well. The majority cannot swallow the majority. We are here. We are the majority right. down here. So you are a minority. And we are older than you. He's right. They are older. That's what he called Israel. Is it real? No, it's not. How did y'all... How did we leave this black and come back white? How did y'all... How did we leave this black and come back white? How did y'all... Good question. Good question. Good question, Eddie. I, I, I'm so glad you're here because you can bring great clarity. Can you tell us a little bit about the Sephardic Jews and how they were scattered because um, they went west? I sure can. Because the reason why I want to is because a lot of them, and a lot of people don't know this, are in the Caribbean. They are. In the islands. And I you're know one that. of them. I know, one of them. <laughs> I know that. I know that. Because, you know, a lot of folk don't know that those roots are there. One of the first uh, batches of slaves that came to Jamaica, they were the Sephardic Jews. It's documented. And they're all over the, Caribbean, over the Caribbean, South America, Central America, yeah. and even the Central, South Central United States. Wow. And DNA testing is a factor in all this now. Genesis chapter 11, verse 10 explains the genealogy of Shem. Shem was a black man in Africa. If you repeat this fact, I can't laugh at you. If you repeat this fact, I can't laugh at you. I want to say peace and blessings to everyone. Hope all is well with you guys. I want to say Shalom Ablak, Mash Pakha. Hope you guys are having a blessed Shabbat. I want to say Shabbat Shalom. I hope and pray that it is well with you guys. And uh, we're not going to uh, prolong uh, getting into the lesson. Uh, I did want to start off with some videos, clips, just to kind of set the tone here. And we got a lot to cover. So initially, I was going to do this lesson tomorrow night, but I chose to do it tonight, give you guys some uh, room to be able to go over the lesson. And tomorrow night, I want to schedule it to do a discussion about the whole uh, selective, uh, what I call a selective outrage when it comes to the uh, Netflix movie, excuse me, the Netflix documentary with um, Jada Pickett Smith that was uh, that helped produce this. And I want to really cover, I want to really discuss that because this is a lot of. Uh, as we, as I call it, selective, uh, selective outrage over uh, the situation with that, and um, how things are being blown completely out of proportion. So, I really want to deal with that, and again, selective outrage. So, we're going to cover that tomorrow from the 18th dynasty, but the base of it is it still has some of the locks in it, but it, this portion of it looks straight. Right? The, the, these are melanated people family. See, if we allow them to change and modify all the players in Africa, like key players that we see within our scriptures, the Egyptians, and the scripture tells us not to abhor an Egyptian. Right? But we see the Egyptians. We see Ethiopia. Those are some of the communities that are connected to our community in terms of interaction. That's the point I want to make. So, let's show a couple of more images. Hold up, hold up. Bear with me one second here. Not sure. Let me take this down for a second. Slide up here. I heard a little feedback, so that's why I'm pausing real quick. All right. This was an ancient Egyptian woman. The right. ancient original yeah. Egyptian woman. Anyway, that this, should do it. This is an Egyptian woman. All right, let me bring it back up. All right, so. 
This here is Nefertiti. This is this is Nefertiti family. From Egypt. This is Nefertiti. From Egypt. She has braids in her hair. From Egypt. This is Nefertiti, not the one that uh, you saw. Some of you guys saw on uh, Good Morning America that that nonsense that they tried to share and show how she would look, and they made her <coughs> look uh, more European. Made her look European, not more European. One made made her look Turkish. And we'll deal with that a little bit for a quick minute. But look at look at what you see here. Right? These are braids. These are braids. See, they, they're not going to show you this image of Nefertiti. 18th century. 18th dynasty, rather. They're not going to show you this here. They're not going to show you this here. Now, what current Egypt has got their hair that, like that? Uh, Northern Egypt. Women wore, some of the women wore uh, in the 18th dynasty. These are the 18th dynasty weights here. Look how they look. I got. I have more pictures. I have more pictures that I can show. Matter of fact, I can show this video while I'm talking, but let me bring it up here. I'll, I'll just play this video real quick. Let me play this video here quick and you'll see a video of wigs, Negro wigs in the British Museum. This is this is what they don't want to show you. This is what they don't want to show us. But yet they have the audacity to call us uh, Kevin Hart, uh, Jada Pickett, uh, the Afrocentric movement, so to speak, as that guy uh, Youssef completely lied about. want to come up with this term uh, black washing <laughs> where so the question you can ask them well if they are the original people why are they practicing Islam now why is Islam pretty much the uh, religion you. of the land right in Egypt they practice Islam majority It's the original hair. Now, what current Egyptians, you know, get current hair like that from generations in northern Egypt, in northern, in some northern Egypt, Arabic speaking, not not the black ones. Remember this? This is pretty much a review from uh, kind of like a 
yeah, a review from uh, the previous lesson. And I'm going here for a reason. I want to touch a little bit on this black horse. Again, I want to reiterate this black horse. So you see here, Revelation chapter 6, verse 5 and 6, it says, And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see, and I beheld, and lo, a black horse. Now, when you read this, right, because this connects directly with Zechariah chapter 6, horse is plural. That's why I put the plural here. Because uh, if you really want to understand this prophecy, you have to go to Zechariah 6. For those that are not familiar with the book of Revelation, you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, try to understand these pro prophecies or make an attempt to understand these prophecies without going to Jeremiah, without going to Zechariah, without going to the book of Daniel, without going to the book of Ezekiel, without going to the book of Isaiah, because these prophecies go hand in hand. So horse is actually plural. So the black horses is plural. All right. So it goes on to say, and he sat, he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. Verse six. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. So when, uh, when we talked about this, when we discussed this last week, we dealt with the transatlantic world war, right? It still connected this to the white horse, connected this to this particular horse to capitalism. And we're going to still piggyback on the capitalism, but I want to show you this again. I want to go through this particular portion of the slides again from last week, just a refresher. The transatlantic world war. This is coming from slavery and the Catholic Church. Right? Papal grants to the king of Portugal, the kings of Portugal, plural. Right? Remember, the black horse is plural, horses. The white horse is plural, white horses. All in Zechariah, they're plural. So not just uh, one individual or one particular nation all those that are connected to that nation, all those that are connected to this belief system. So Papa grants to the kings of Portugal, giving authority to enslave the Saracens and other non-Christians of West Africa, with whom Christendom is at war, 1452 through 1514. In 1452, no, 1442, it, 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 actually, let me go back here. I want to just brush over it. It says, Christendom is at war. Forgive me for brushing over this. Because I want to reiterate that point. For those that keep looking at the transatlantic slave trade as a slave trade. It was a world war. It's not a slave trade. It was never a slave trade. It was a world war. They declared war. That white horse declared war. And all can, all that's connected to that white horse can uh, declare war and all those that are connected to that black horse was still by way of that white horse made a lot of money capitalism so papal grants to the kings of Portugal given the giving authority to enslaved Saracens and other non-Christians of West Africa with whom Christendom is at war Christendom is synonymous to Catholicism or Catholic Truth be told, the word Christian, or oh, Christianity rather, uh, did not exist until the 10th century. They were Catholics. Um, again, is uh, synonymous to Catholics. But Christendom is at war. 1452, 1514, and 1442, a Portuguese captain brought to the Gold Coast some Moorish prisoners of war exchange them for 10 Negro slaves. Not going to go into the details. There's a reason why you see Moorish versus Negroes making a distinction. Right? Making a distinction here. Right? Of who's who. Moorish, Muslims, Negroes, of course, our people. And brought these back to Lisbon, a trading settlement and established at was established at Lagos, 
by 1444. It would appear that by 1452, the Portuguese were anxious to establish their property rights over the newly over their newly discovered West African territories. And so Pope Nicholas V was approached and was apparently led to believe that these territories of the Guinea coast were inhabited by Saracens and other enemies of Christendom. There is no other explanation of a series of papal documents, right? Papa, documents of Papa, which applied the well-known contemporary rules of war. Let me say that again. Which applied the well-known contemporary rules of war. So, uh, not only did we have nations at war with us, we had the religious system of Catholicism coming against our community. We had Christians that was coming against our community. And anyone that was connected to this white horse, connected to that black horse, and I'm going to mention a few of them here in a second here, they were all part of this war, declared war on our community. But the Pope, the well-known contemporary rules of war to the situation in West Africa, whereas port, the Portuguese were well aware the local Negro inhabitants were not Saracens, were not Muslims, and were not en the enemies of Christendom. So we're going to break down Saracens so you understand what it means. Said that they were not Muslims. Said that they were not enemies of Christendom. Why is that? Okay, so again, they were not Saracens, were not Muslims. So let's see who the Saracens are. This is coming from the Britannica online, right? This is what it says, Saracen, in the Middle Ages, any person, Arab, Turk, or others who profess the religion of Islam. Let me say that again. Arab, Turk, or other who profess religion of Islam. So when it says that they are not Saracens, it said that they are not Arabs, these people are not Turks, and they are not professing the religion of Islam. That's what this means. So again, let's start with Saracens. Say that they were not Saracens, they are not Arabs, they are not Turks. Let's just reiterate this point here. The Saracens, they were not Saracens. So the Saracens, just to make it so, so that way we understand the slide, is okay, the Saracens they are Arabs, they are Turks, they are those that are practicing Islam. That's who they identify. So the Saracens were Arabs, they were Turks. All right? So let's go back to, again, this attributes of this black horse. What is the attributes of this black horse? I'm going to bring all of this together. Instead of a weapon, the black horse riders has a pair of balances in his hand. All right? Balance indicates commerce. They are used to measure an item being bought or sold. Who is being bought? Who is being sold? They even had their own currency for our people. The Manila bracelet, bracelets, you know those bracelets you see today that uh, many of our brothers and sisters are wearing, uh, those bronze bracelets. Guess what? That was currency. That was currency, depending on uh, how many marks on it in the tone, the lightness or the, the, the tone right, of, of the uh, bracelet determine how many uh, slaves that bracelet was worth. It had an actual currency for our people, buying and selling our, our people. So again, instead of a weapon, uh, the black horse riders has a pair of balances in his hand. Balances indicate commerce. They are used to measure an item being bought or sold. So there is a spirit in this world, a spirit that was back then, that's still today, that is very similar to communism. But its message is trade. This particular horse, its message is driven by capitalism. So again, it says that they were not Saracens. In other words, they were not Turks. So remember, Saracens are Arabs and Turks. Well, why am I saying that? Because if you understand what uh, uh, Aaron uh, Elhik or Elhype, the geneticist John Hopkins, he proved through 
DNA through genetics that most of the Jewish community of today are descendants of Turks. Let me prove it here. This is coming out of uh, out of Kazaria. Evidence for Jewish genome lacking. These are his words, right? And I'm going to drop this link inside the chat for those that want to have a copy of this. All right. Hopefully they didn't take the, uh, the link down, but it still should be there. I'm going to drop the link inside the comments section. All right, let's see here. All right, let me copy this link. Ain't that something? That's why right, in, in Israel today, that's why it looks similar to the same. When you look at the Palestinians and, right. and some Jewish people, so you guys have it they, so they're pretty much the same. Later. So Aaron Elhike, a geneticist at the Johns, Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, thinks so. In a recently published study in Genome Biology Evolution, he is calling for a rewrite of commonly held assumptions about Jewish ancestry. Instead of being primarily the descendants of the 12 tribes, present-day Jewish populations are, finds el primarily the children of a Turkish people. Let me read it one more time. Let me read it one more time. What? Present-day Jewish population Jewish population are, are. finds El Haik or El Haik. El Haik. Primarily, Primarily the children, children of a Turkish people. Of a Turkish people. Zionism. That's who running Zionism. That's who, who run the state of right? Israel. And of course, the Jews were major players. The Jewish community, as yes, we yes. know them, were major players with, with owning slaves. You guys remember this source. I'll bring this source up from time to time. Jews and, and Judaism in the United States, a documentary history. Rabbi Mark Lee Raphael. So no one can say that I'm making this up. This is a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi, a, a book that he wrote, 1983. Notice what he says here. Jews also took an active part in the Dutch what? colonial slave trade. No. Indeed, the bylaws of the recipe in Mauritius uh, congregations, uh, it says in 1648, Included an imposta, in other words, a Jewish tax of five soldos for each Negro slave a Brazilian Jew purchased from the West Indies Company. Slave auctions were postponed if they fell on a Jewish holiday. In Correcchio, uh, excuse me if I butchered the name, in the 17th century, as well as in the British colonies of Barbados and Jamaica in the 18th century, Jewish merchants played a major role in the slave trade. Let me say that again. Jewish merchants played a major role in the, the slave, slave trade. trade. In fact, in all the American colonies, whether French, British, or Dutch, Jewish merchants frequently dominated. Let me say that again. The Jewish merchants frequently dominated. And they still do. Let me read it one more time. In fact, in all the American colonies, wait a minute, in all the American colonies, let me say it one more time, in all of the American colonies, whether oh. French, no. whether it's British or Dutch, Jewish merchants frequently dominated. I just 
Not the chosen and people. Exchange them for molasses, which in turn was taken. To no, no, not the chosen people. The ones we sent billions of millions of dollars to? Jewish people? God's chosen people? In New England, they converted it to rum for, for sale in Africa. Right? New England, that's where, that's where you get into Massachusetts, Vermont, Connecticut, that area. Yes. There were slave uh, 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 Jewish settlements up there. And yes, you had slaves up in that area. All right? So again, this is just giving us some names here, but it makes it clear these from, from a Jewish writer? These individuals here are Jewish. No. Right? This is Charleston, Charleston, South Carolina, Philadelphia, Newport News, Virginia. It says here dominated Jewish slave trading on the American continent. In these European outposts, the Jews, with their years of mercantile experience and networks of friends and family providing market reports of great use, played a significant role in the merchant capitalism. Didn't we just say that? Capitalism? Didn't we just mention that? We just mentioned that. Confirming that they are part of that black horse. They are a part of that black horse. Can't get around it, family. Can't get around it. Can't get around it. The chosen these people? European outposts, the Jews with their years of mercantile experience and networks of friends and family providing market reports of great use played a significant role in the merchant capitalism, commercial revolution, Right? In territorial expansion from that a Jewish writer a new world and cool. established the colonial. So I guess he, he'd be anti Semitic too. And we, we know it's a Jewish looking person. For something new. The new world order has been here and running in full, with full steam. Anyone that's prophesying <coughs> the prophecy of sin, uh, anticipating of a new world order, they're not teaching prophecy correctly. They're teaching a Eurocentric, a, Euro, a heavily Euro-influenced prophecy. Mm -hmm. The New World Order has been in full effect. So capitalism, commercial revolution, and territorial expansion that developed the New World and established the colonial economics. The Jewish Caribbean nexus provided Jews with the opportunity to claim a disproportionate influence in the 17th the 18th century, New World commerce and enabled West Indy Jewry far outnumbering, he said that again, far outnumbering its core uh, co religionists further north to enjoy a certain uh, central, uh, centrality with North American Jewry, would not achieve for a long time to come. Groups of Jews began to arrive in Suriname in the middle of the 17th century after the Portuguese regained control of northern Brazil by 1694, 27 years after the British had surrounded Suriname to Dutch, there were about 100 Jewish families and 50 single Jews. There were about 570 persons. They possessed more than 40 estates and 9,000 slaves contributed 25,905 pounds of sugar as a gift for the building of a hospital and carried on an active trade with Newport and other colonial ports. By 1730, Jews owned 115 plantations and were a large part of a sugar export business. This is where you get Domino Sugar, right? Which sent out 21,680,000 pounds of sugar to European and, the, and New World markets in 1730 alone. Slave trading was a major feature of Jewish economics, going back to capitalism. Slave trading 
was a major feature of Jewish economic life in Suriname, which as a major stopping off point in the triangle of trade, both North American come from and a Jewish man. Played a major He's reading from a Jewish man. Commerce. All right, so our Arabs, the Saracens, they are Turks. And we also prove that the Saracens, right, they can connect, they, they're closely related to the Jewish community as we know them. But let's take it a step further. These modern Arabs, right, these modern Arabs, they're not the ancient Arabs. They're not the, the seeds of Ishmael. Mm -mm. These modern Arabs are Turks. Mm -hmm. All right? Mm-hmm. Some of you guys may have seen, uh, seen the short video I uploaded yesterday, but this is just kind of echoing yesterday, and I just want to echo a little bit what was said here, right? Uh, this is an article here about uh, the director of Cleopatra Speaks Out. She, speak, she spoke out and addressed the, uh, the uh, selective outrage. It says here, while shooting, I became the target of a huge online hate campaign. Egyptians accused me of blackwashing and stealing their history. <laughs> stealing their history. But notice what she says here. Some threat to ruin my career, which I wanted to tell them was laughable. I was ruining it very well for myself. Thank you very much. No amount of reasoning or reminders that Arab invasions had not yet happened in Cleopatra's age. If you understand what she said here, this is a mic drop right here, because what we Ooh. hear from these, from from the church, what we hear from Ooh. the Jewish community as we know them, what we hear from all these different groups, they try to tell you, for example, that the they, they use these Turks as the barometer of trying to say how the people, in what they call the Middle East today, which is Northeast Africa, look. This is where you get the term. Uh, and I'm sure you guys probably heard this before. Uh, you know, Christ, he wasn't black, but he wasn't white either. He was olive. Now, have you guys heard that before? If you heard that that before, yeah. just, yeah. just type one. As a matter of fact, yeah. I'll, put a, yeah. I'll put it up here. Yeah. You know. must be so black I'll olive. Put a, um, a poll here. Oh. That's just a... I'm going to stop it right there. Check this out. I'll get back to him. What does super mean to you? The swish of that. We're getting ready for the biggest football game of the... So yesterday I made a response video to at least one clip, which there are several, uh, from a particular sister, not find out her name, by the name of Michelle Maiden. Uh, she made a video speaking about, you know, the differences with at least her and her culture and how she feels and which it represented her opinion. It didn't represent all the people of Haiti. Um, it didn't even represent all Haitian immigrants. And I think I've said that several times in the previous video. But what, what happens in a lot of these comment sections, we have multiple people that I really want to address in here because I think the level of ignorance at times is annoying and downright embarrassing. We have grown people that do not listen and comprehend at all. They hear one thing and they run off with it. They say they don't listen to the whole thing a person is saying. They just hear one thing and they go with it and they shut down everything else that the person could even say it right after the fact. It could have been 30 seconds later. They could have clarified a point. It could have been a minute later. They could explain why they actually said it. But usually when they leave comments, um, they you to tell on themselves. And if you are a person that's really, really grown, right, and you don't listen and comprehend, I can tell certain things may not be right in your personal life due to that. Because when you are grown, especially when you're trying to run multiple things, and say like me, you know, I'm running, you know, a company, have to manage multiple issues, multiple people, you know, worry about, you know, payroll, making sure that happens. Uh, making sure taxes are paid, making sure so many different things. It's a lot going on, right? I have to listen to a lot of people and comprehend what they're saying 
so I can execute. If I was a lot like some of you that didn't listen to one thing and didn't have no comprehension of it, I wouldn't be in the position I am today. You understand? But we'll get to all of that. So let's talk about correction. Correction and chastisement is something you do when you love someone. You don't do it when you hate them. When you hate the white supremacist lives his or her life in grand delusion. They are maintaining their system by falsehood and outright lies. I've told you this many, many times before. Case in point, we have Matt Walsh. He is one of the hosts on the Daily Wire. I want you to hear a 30-second clip of what he said about colonization because a lot of y'all really think that these people really have some sort of moral compass about themselves and they don't. Let's go ahead and roll that. Colonization was a good thing they did. The conquest and colonization and settling of this land was overall a good and noble and courageous thing. It is good that it happened and we should be grateful for it. The people who came here and claimed this land were heroes. It was heroic. And they were heroes not because of the other good stuff, but because they came and claimed it. As you heard, he said it with a straight face that colonization was good. Them coming over to this land was a good thing. Them slaughtering the Native Americans was good. Them abusing them were good. It was great to enslave our ancestors. For, for 250 plus years. It was also great for them to be pedos and uh, violators of, of women, men, and children. It was also great for them to steal resources. It was also great for them to put us in Jim Crow. It was great for them to steal our land. The Ku Klux Klan, it was, they was great too. They was necessary because they had to keep the black people in line. I mean, everything that happened to us the reason why these people get so upset when we talk about reparations is because they feel everything they did was good or a necessary thing for them to have something. And when you live on that kind of lie and falsehood, the reason why they hate the black man and woman of America and also throughout the world is because we have been the truth tellers and the truth bearers of who they really are. Listen, they don't want us to tell nobody who they really are. That's why when they tell immigrants that come into this country, they tell them what? Stay away from them black Americans. Why? Because the black American is a truth teller. They're going to tell you if they're screwing you with a job. The black American going to tell you if who they really are. The black American going to say, look, here's a mirror to put up to them when they try to tell you anything. See, they don't want us to tell nobody who they are. They don't want even history out there because if history even be out there, then they have to deal with the truth because remember, white supremacy is built off of lies and falsehoods. And you know, any of you have been in any kind of uh, situation where you wasn't telling the truth on something, you know how hard it is to maintain a lie? Some of you may be in the past, in your younger years, maybe was cheating in a relationship. And it was hard to maintain that because when you tell one lie, you got to tell another lie to cover up another lie and another lie and another lie. It's better for you to tell the truth and live your truth than it is to lie all the time. That's why these people got to go to great lengths. They politicians got to go to great lengths to keep the lie going. Nothing, nothing, nothing they have done or contributed has been good at all. Because the few people who have done good things, the evil cancels that out. This is why countries throughout the world right now are starting to band together against the... Can't go? Do this to clear out stuck poop fast. Fiber helps you poop, right? Nope. Accord then against them because they are sick and tired of their crap. They're sick and tired of their hypocrisy. They're sick and tired of their lies that they so much better. they some sort of Christian and they cannot even follow one law in the Ten Commandments. If you can follow the Ten Commandments, it's which is so basic. Don't steal from nobody, which they can't stop doing that. Don't kill people. 
Don't bear false witness. Don't covet your neighbor's property. Simple things they cannot follow. You understand? But they want to walk around with their finger and talk about democracy, and they're not even willing democracy even in their own so-called homeland that they stole. But, you know, hey, they didn't steal anything. They discovered it. You know what I'm saying? See, they get mad when you talk about, I'm not celebrating no Christopher Columbus. I ain't celebrating that devil. Well, now, hey, that's wrong. He, he discovered America. How you discover a place that's already here? How you discover a place where they had people already all in the land? You didn't discover anything. And you didn't even get over here until you got the, the maps from the Moors. You couldn't even get over here on your own. You didn't build anything on your own because even to this day, you're still not maintaining America on your own. Because what are you doing? When the black man and woman you had them enslaved to, to maintain America and build America, and now today, because the black man and woman say, I'm not being your slave no more. I don't even want to work for you. If you and your job, I want to work for myself. Then you go and go get an immigrant when you had a hand in their country, bringing their country down. In Latin America, the continent of Africa, the Caribbean, and anywhere else these people are coming from. Your hands are somewhere causing problems where them people got to leave their they lands to come up here thinking they're going to have a shot. The only thing you're going to give them is a slave wage job. In their country, they may only make $2 a day, but they come up here get a $7 an hour job, they, they hit the big time. Now, when they come up here and do that, they hurt actually people that live here because when people here know their words and tell you what they worth are, you just go bring in an immigrant, and it's all a system that you're playing because you're wicked. It's complete, and they don't feel that they're wicked either, brothers and sisters. They don't feel that. They feel, that, like I said, like he said, everything they do is a good thing. What the police did to George Floyd, hey, that's a good thing. Why? Because it keeps you black people in line. You understand? They really believe the police are there to keep black people in line. The Second Amendment was about keeping black people in line. It wasn't about no tyrannical government. The Second Amendment, when, you, when that came in, and when they started pushing that around 1791 or so, what was going on? It wasn't a tyrannical government. It's when the Haitian Revolution actually got started off. And they did not want that spirit from Haiti to be over here. Willie Lynch. Because some of the Haitians were brought here Willie Lynch. as slaves when they was escaping when all that stuff was jumping off. Willie Lynch. You understand? The Second Amendment, what it really was about for them, was the federal government can get to them in time. So they want their own militias where they can protect themselves regulated by the states. So it was always about trying to keep black people in line. This is why they would never, never, never have true gun control in this country. Never have it. Bill O'Reilly said it a long time ago that their Second Amendment and even what happens all out of it, that's, that's horrible things, is a price you got to pay for freedom. This, this, is, this is their wicked mind. They're constantly having terror attacks in schools. That's what it is. And they could, with a stroke of a pen, end it. They can end all of it. And they will not do it because they fear black people and they want to make sure they can have a way to, to possibly keep black people back in line. You understand what I'm saying? They live their life in fear of what we're going to do or possibly what we're going to do, even though we haven't said we want to do anything. Mm -hmm. But So you're living off of lies and falsehoods and they're living with that fear in the back of their mind because they know what they do to me and you. When we talk about reparations, it gets on their nerves because they know they owe it. Mm -hmm. It's like, we're like a bill collector to them. You know how a bill collector, you know you owe that payment, and the bill collector sending you letters. The bill collector calling you. Get on your nerves. Man, you probably want to block them. You probably want to avoid the letters. You want to do it, but you know you owe them. They put it on your credit report. They do everything. You know you owe that debt. You can, you're not getting away from it. You owe it. And that's what it is with them right now. They know the debt is owed for what they've done to us. Because they stole our land that our ancestors had bought right out. They stole the farmland from many black people. They, they stole inventions. They stole uh, different patents. They stole everything they have. This is why I don't look at them as a group and say, wow, man, I would love to, to be just like them. I don't want to be like that because I, I look up to people who's honorable. I look up people too that, that build things on their own, who 
got it out the mud. That's the kind of people that inspires me. No, people don't inspire me when you have to lie to yourself all the time thinking that you're a good person. You don't inspire me when you have a system built to cheat all the time. The whole system built for them to cheat. They, they do not know how to compete. Every time they get put in a position where they have to compete on an equal level, especially with black people, they lose. This is why they always want to make sure that the system is unequal. True. Fact. So they got to tell themselves that they got to put out propaganda like that video to about themselves to keep reassuring themselves with lies. They got to have the scientists basically trying to burn the books, but it don't work because you're not in control of the information like you used to be. People will tell the truth, put out the history. The more you try to hide it, the more it comes out. We live in the information age. But all we have, brothers and sisters, is the truth. And, and the scriptures teach knowing the truth, not just the truth, but knowing the truth is what sets you free. And we, we free because we have the truth on our side. We got God on our side. We did not make a covenant with Satan like the white supremacists did. So you make a covenant with Satan, you got to live by lies. You got to live by cheating. You got to live by, by taking people's life, taking people's resources. You got to live like that because you're in league with Satan. See, see, when you're in league with the Lord, you don't have to steal from people. You don't have to harm nobody. Right. You don't have to do anything. Right. You can just live your truth and still be blessed at the end of the day. And listen, everything that has happened to us in, the, in this land, even though we're dealing with a demonic entity, we are still progressing in spite of. Mm -hmm. We are still rising in spite of. Mm -hmm. They even had a global pandemic show up. And even after that, we're coming out of that better than before. Even during that time, yep. black people created more businesses than any other group. And then what did the devil do? The devil, Joe Biden and them. What did they do? Well, we're going to put a law. Well, you make $600 or more on Cash App, Venmo, PayPal. You got to report it to the IRS. That's just like the devil, right? When black people figure out a way to not work for them and start providing for themselves, they make it just as much harder. Because right. before it used to be $20,000. This is why I tell you black people, with the Democrat Party, I tell you, they're not your friend. They want to keep you on Section 8. They want to keep you down. They want to keep you on food stamps. They are not for the progression of black people. And I'm not saying the Republicans are for the pro progression of black people. But black people who are entrepreneurs... Black people who are trying to get themselves out the mud, Republican policies are better for, for black people who's doing that. You understand? All, both of them racist. Both of them. Republicans and Democrats. They are both white supremacists. Exactly. So, so let's establish that. Exactly. But if you are a black business owner or you just starting your business, Republican policies going to work out better for you. Because at the end of the day, it's about... Getting, uh, getting our uh, depending on ourselves and doing for self, right? Because when when you when you look at the Democrat Party, all they want you to do is be be stuck on a system. Mm -hmm. We didn't vote for these people fifty plus years, and look at what we do. We still got Section Eight. We still got welfare, food stamps. We are not performing the way we should perform, like our ancestors performed. Our ancestors didn't have no no welfare, food stamps. They were no for, for legacy Section Eight members I'm all for cutting all that mess off because I know the greatness of black people and unfortunately some of our people believe in the lies as people told to you unfortunately you accepted the lies of the devil you have drunk you have drunk the, the, the lie of Satan a lot of you have that's why you think it's okay to be on welfare and food stamps all your life that's why it's okay for you to be lazy it's why it's okay for you to be out here committing crimes or harming black people and give an excuse for it. This is why I call for, I always say call for a great separation in our community because we need to separate from those who are grafting themselves in with the devil in our own community. But to those of us who, who get it, to those of us who say, I'm not working for these people, I'm not begging these people to go take a vacation. I'm not begging these people if I need to go spend time with my child. I work for myself. And then I do what I got to do for self. 
But even though the devil trying to make it hard on you, we still going to get past that either. Who can pass all that? See how they lied to you? Well, if you make 400000 you don't have nothing to worry about. Well, sound like $600 is a lot less than 400000 right? But this is what happens when a lot of you put your trust in, in, the, in the system that the devil has created. This is the reason why they took this young man off. In chains, he that led the captive shall go into captive. That's why I took this young man off. Now, as you all know, the Bible is an African Judean book. We've talked about this family. Everything in that book goes back to an African Eastern people, an African Judean sentiment, right? The first Garden of Eden, the Garden of Eden, and the rivers first mentioned in the scriptures surround the land of Ethiopia. We talked about this, right? The Bible mentions Africa, Egypt near eight to nine hundred times just in the Old Testament. Greece is mentioned no more than ten times. Now, if you include the book of Maccabees, that's where you see the Greco-Roman history. The Bible is a black Hebrew Judean book. Why do I bring this up? The Middle East, so-called, is a new term. The land of Israel in antiquity was the land of Ham. Canaan was the son of Ham. So this was just an extension of Africa. Y'all understand? The Middle East was just Northeast Africa in antiquity, right? Now I'm going to show y'all a clip where our brothers that live in Demona, shout out to those Demona Israelites, they show living in the land a, a uh, landmark sign that shows that the land of Israel sits on the African tectonic plate. Let's check that out. Back to this land. Uh, we consider Israel to be northeast Africa. We are living here in the southern portion of Israel in what is known as the southern Judean mountains. And, uh, of course, we have to make this clear that, that Israel uh, predates any uh, Palestinian uh, connections here to this land. When you look at the name of Palestine, it was the name that the Romans gave to the land formerly known as Judea. Now, I didn't say Jewish or uh, Judaism, but Judea. So the Judeans were the people that actually lived in this portion of this land prior to the uh, it being named Palestine by the Romans. So this is what we consider to be Northeast Africa. We are sitting on the African tectonic plate. There are African species of birds and animals and, and plants that you'll find all throughout this region. Why I took you here is that I want to show you that the country called Israel is sitting on the African tectonic plate. Now, we're going to go here and I want to show you where Israel sits on the African tectonic plate, which means that Israel is northeast Africa. Now, when we look at this map, this is the, this is the Sinai. Okay? This is the Red Sea. This is Egypt. This is the Sinai. This is Israel. Alright? This is Saudi Arabia over here. Now, if you see this in Hebrew, it says Haluak Africani, the African plate. Here it is right here. Israel is sitting right here. Israel is sitting on the Haluak Africani, which means that Israel is north East Africa. Now, family, this is the part y'all been waiting for. Your boy is about to show y'all Gentile brothers and sisters that have been saying that know that we're the people that are acknowledging it, that are using their voice. We're gonna, I'm just going to play the video and y'all prepare your hearts. The nations know who we are. Zion, it's time to wake up and turn back to Torah. Turn back to the law, statutes, and commandments of the Most High Yah. Let's look at all these Gentiles admitting that the so-called blacks are actually the biological descendants of the children of Israel. Let's look at it. I just want to be coached here to uh, enforce the knowledge on here about who the true biblical Hebrew Israelites are. Um, one line wise, they are the so-called African Americans. The wisdom of Solomon in the Apocrypha, the fifth chapter, talks about how Jacob so-called black man is uh, that chosen line. 
tell you that blacks for as many centuries as whites have been uh, superior, if you want, in the Western world, that for just as many centuries blacks were superior, you'd probably find that hard to believe. And you wonder how such a fact could be hidden. And the answer is again collusion. The whites wouldn't want to admit such a thing. And those whites like to feel superior. I like to think that their superiority is somehow permanent. As for blacks, if you look into the black civilizations that we're going to take a look at momentarily, you find something that's pretty interesting. The life of those civilizations actually arose as Jewish civilizations later to become. From the West Africa, they have been taken as a slave to America. Brothers and sisters, blacks of America, it's you. You are the true Hebrews. You are the true Hebrews from the Bible. America uh, do everything, gonna invest as much money as he has, and gonna fight as much wars as they, as they can, gonna invite as much weapons as they can, just to hide the things away from you. Gonna take Israel, gonna bring white people here, and to tell you these are the Jews, gonna, do, gonna kill you, gonna kill arms, gonna mistreat white people like this guy, just to tell you this lie. Live in Israel.
children. Don't know what a good, good father I am. They haven't experienced how perfect I am. Right now, they are scrambling. They're woken up and they're scrambling because it says in my word that if you remember my, remember my covenant I made with you, then I will remember you. So these people are scrambling and many of them are very angry. You have no place, none, to be ridiculing them. These are God's children. That's what Jesus says to do. Pray for your enemies. But guess what? They're not your enemies. The Hebrew is the, re the reason why salvation was brought to the world. Through their failure, we, the rest of us, have been grafted in. It's all in Scripture. I don't have the Bible with me, so I can't look it up, and I'm really bad with my memory. But I'm speaking truth. Scripture. Okay? Shame on you, America. Calling them the worst hate group in America. When we, as Americans, America has raped, murdered, made them property. God's children. You know what else the Lord told me? If you are Hebrew and you're watching, bless you. I'm praying for you. Those that are angry, I'm praying for you. Those that are hurting, I'm praying for you. Those that are reaching out, wondering, what does this mean? What do I do? I'm praying for you. And the Lord is coming back. He's coming for you. Because, as I said, 92% of the people that say that they are Jews today are in fact Ashkenazi, sons of Goma, so thereby are the synagogue of Satan they who say they are Jews and are not. So who are the real Jews? That's the question that has been posed to me many times over the past months. And there's really two answers to that question. And I'm going to be thorough today because I need to be thorough. Because when you speak about this, it's going to upset a lot of people. So we're going to have to take our time in the scripture, so bear with me. Two answers to that question. One, I already addressed in the rotting stick of false restoration and the synagogue of Satan teaching. And that is, who are the true Jews? We well, already spoke about that earlier at Sukkot. Even the Ethiopian Jews, they're called the Falashas, meaning those that are black. Zephania, chapter 3, verse 10. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshippers, the daughters, my dispersed ones. That's the queen of Sheba and her sons migrated and dispersed to Ethiopia. Lamentations, chapter 4, verse 2. The precious sons of Zion are comparable to fine gold. Verse 8, their visage is blacker than coal. And the concise Oxford English Dictionary, the 10th edition, tells us that visage is a poetic literary of a person's face with reference to the form of their features. A person's facial expression is what? Blacker than coal. You start to connect the language and you start to see. Bereshit, Genesis chapter 9, verse 27. We have got the Ashkenazi sons of Japheth that have infiltrated into the land and are what? They've got the whole world convinced. The whole world convinced that they are sons of Shem. But look what it says in Bereshit chapter 9, verse 27. It actually tells you that Yahweh, who is omnipotent, it is his will because he has actually deceived them into doing this. They are so deceived into doing this. Look at Genesis 9, 20, 27. Elohim will entice and deceive. The Hebrew word there is papa. Papa, he will deceive Japheth, Ooh, Ashkenaz, man. the sons of Japheth, and he will dwell, that means Ashkenaz will dwell in the tents of the Shemites. Is that what's happening today? 
Has he deceived the Ashkenazi so much, those from the Russian steppes, the Caucasians, he's deceived them so much that they're actually dwelling in the place where the real Shemite should dwell? Genesis 9, verse 27. You see, Yahweh is the one that has deceived. He has enticed Japheth. Patar, deceived, enticed. He's de deceived and enticed the Ashkenazi Jews into believing that they're the Jews and they've built the Zionist state of Israel today. Hold of the riddle, did she not deceitfully? And Delilah made Shimshon Samson sleep upon her knees and she called for a man and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head and she began to afflict him and his strength went from him. You see, Samson was the first Rasta. He was a Negro lion fighter, similar to the African Maasai tribe, Judges 14.5 and 16.19. You see, Samson mm. tore a lion apart as he would a young mm. goat. And as a Nazarite, he wore seven dreadlocks. He was mahogany in body color, just like Malcolm X. And his visage was blacker than coal. He was a Negro. Lam and guess who else was a Nazareth? Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> Presentations 4, 7, and 8. And this is really Jesus hard of for people to see in Scripture. Boom. Because predominantly it has been the Caucasians that have been in charge of the Scriptures, right? For millennia. Lamentations 5.10 Our skin was black like an oven. Job 30 verse 30 My skin is black upon me and my bones are burned with heat. Deuteronomy 26, 28 Excuse me. Deuteronomy 28 verse 68 And Yahweh shall bring you into Mitzrayim, Egypt again with ships. And the way of which I said to you, you shall see it no more again. And there you shall be sold to your enemies for slaves and female slaves. And no man shall buy you. And that is what happened to the regal class of the house of Judah. And they say nothing. And we, they're funding our politicians. Funding our politicians. And you don't think this message is relevant? Because people do, oh, well, let's just stick to, you know, safe and secure. Meanwhile, we're all going down the, sh the street to destruction. Do you really think they care what color your skin is? They just want to enslave you all. But they don't want you to really tell the black Negro in America what tribe he's from and who truly enslaves him. And I'd like to now bring up another interesting place that you find the descendants of the Israelites, but may not necessarily be from the Ten Tribes, but will also play a role. And shouldn't be overlooked. It's a very serious scenario. This is in Africa. Africa has perhaps hundreds of millions of people with this identity right now, of being from the people of Israel. Does that mean they were from the Ten Tribes? Likely not. We were taught by the historians and within our own traditions that when the Romans conquered Judea a few hundred years after that the tribes of Israel went into exile, perhaps millions of Judeans were sold into slavery, into Africa, into Rome, deep into Africa. And if you look now, you're seeing people who are most likely the descendants of those slaves who kept true. I'd like to bring up a few specific examples. They're going to be game changers. One of them wrote letters to Israel when it became a state. And they said, we're, uh, we're Israelites out in Africa. And everyone laughed at them and they said, African Israelites, these people are just trying to jump on the first world country bandwagon. They're living in a third world country. They got nothing. We're coming to Israel. We got innovation, technology. So they're trying to get on this train because there's such a thing called the right of return. All descendants of the Jewish people from around the world are able to move to Israel. So they, they said we are also. And everyone kind of laughed at them, like I said. And a few people took it serious and went out there and started studying them, learned about their culture. And a professor from Duke University went out there 
and did DNA testing on them. And they showed not only did they share Semitic genes from people who were in Yemen back to the Middle East, these gentlemen, a large percent of them, have the Y chromosome to be Kohanim, to be priests. Now, if anyone doesn't know, priest is a specific family clan of the nation of Israel who come from Aaron, the brother of Moses, who was the first priest. And anyone descended from Aaron is, has the, the, the status title priest. And we found that these men in this village in South Africa called Lemba, L-E-M-B-A, carry this genetic marker to let us know that they share, the same as from the Svartic and the Ashkenaz and the population of the people in Israel today, they share the same exact DNA marker. It's mind-blowing. So everyone kind of got humbled a little bit who, who laughed at them and said, now, now, now what? Now what do we do about this? It's going to have tremendous implications. Another area in Africa you have uh, something big happening is in Nigeria. You have the Igbo people, or Igbo, pronounced either way. There's 40 million of them, also Christians, like I spoke about before, how that could happen to the children of Israel very easily. But also a lot of them are now coming out and converting back or adopting the, the rules of the Torah without all the paganism that they've been practicing for hundreds of years. There's been books written about it from scholars in Nigeria, from scholars from the Jewish people. And where it gets interesting is, in America, there was a slave trade. And a lot of the slaves, a very high percentage of them, came from Western Nigerian ports. And in America today, you see a, a very large movement of African Americans who say that they're the real chosen people, that they're the children of Israel, they're the Judeans. You know, so what, are they just trying to create a, an identity for themselves because they were slaves, or is there really something here? And the answer is, most likely there is something there. And most likely, maybe that they were the original Israelites, and maybe that the Jewish people today who are white, Caucasian people, um, came in a little bit later on. We know that some of the greatest sages of the transmission of the Torah were converts from Rome. You have a man named Uncleus who, who wrote a commentary on the... So y'all, I'm telling you, you saw what that brother said. Shout out to the Gentiles that are saying this stuff. Shout out to Harry uh, Rosenberg, the rabbi. I don't know. That's a lot of testicular fortitude that that brother has to come out and defend our people, defend the Igbo, defend the Limba. Shout out to that brother because that takes courage to do that. All Gentiles that are not lost in the sauce, those that are standing with us, it's warfare time. You saw us amping up the antics, right? And he, they're trying to come against this truth, so I, I just bless all of you Gentiles that are pinning your neck out on the line, just like Nick Cannon said what he said. And y'all don't bash the brother and say, oh, well, he reneged afterward. You don't know what you would do in that situation. He already had got the word out, right? And, and what I'm saying is, I'm not condoning going back on what you said, but don't judge somebody before you walk them out in their shoes. That That's so true. And I'm going to about to end this video. Um, yeah. Now you now it's not a black thing, it's a white thing, it's a truth thing. And, and and people when you make videos like this, you know, they took their young brother off. They they took his stuff off. And many of but there's more truth coming out. And now that's considered anti Semitic. But even the writer even even said that we're Jewish. So they point out with Jewish people the same people who they saying that you bring in this anti-Semitic stuff, so the Jewish people are anti-Semitic. How can the writer that does on the first film be anti when he's Jewish? He's Jewish, and even it's the last video. So you are gonna pu pu punish the people who's bringing the truth to 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 the people. And there's other people are seeing the truth. And this is what they're scared of. They're scared of the truth. Because they can't stand truth. You can't stop truth. You never can stop truth. If God is put in the earth, it's coming forth. No matter how you shut it down, it's coming forth.
in the spirit. And that's something. Some people got the spirit of truth. And the spirit don't have us come a certain way when it comes to the truth. When the truth is the truth, you got to go with it, buddy. And they shut, they probably try to run him, shut his channel down. But other people are coming with it. There are white people coming with, with this truth. Other people, Miss Middle Eastern people, these other people telling the truth. And they get demonetized for telling the truth. But the signs are there. The signs are there. Let's go back. I want to show you before I end this video. What's, what's America? What's, a, what's really going on in America? America is going to barren towns. America, by doing justice to people, is reaping as one of the many things that there are sundown towns, there are towns that go on barren, there are towns that when you see some artists, there's no economy. It, it takes the fact. You can't deny that. That there's, there's, and that's why when you go in different parts of the United States, that's why. And, and where in the places in the United States was, lynchings was, injustice was, and everything. Systematic racism, systematic racism is crushing America. And they don't even know it. R crushing America because as Phil say, out of fear and ignorance. So like he said, they got to keep the gun. And it, because you, they don't want you to rise. And, it, and they intellectually don't think you can rise. Ain't that something? For generation after generation, they taught black people intellectually slow. Intellectually not even human. Intellectually everything. So now it's proven that other people, the spirit of truth has come down. And people can, they can't, um, they can't bear with it. And they lose in their mind. They're literally losing their mind by people telling the truth. Anyway, I, I, but I'm, yeah, I was, I was going to check this. It's kind of long, but they're scared of the truth. So all these people is making this stuff up. All these, <laughs> all this stuff, all because of that. All because of truth. They couldn't stand the truth. So what they do, do is that they get it. They think that they can stop it. You can't. We don't want our. We don't want our kids. I bet you the same thing. I bet you the Rome and the ancient civilization said we don't want our kids to suffer and know that we did. If we learn about ancient Rome and ancient Babylon and ancient Greece for another 150 years, ancient America is going to be the same way. However long God allow America to, to be America, and they will be look and generations will be looking back. So it, it so it don't matter what they try to take out, make a law. They probably they they would they could have they could make a law back then, but people found out information, didn't they? What makes you don't think that they gonna find out another hundred years? What, 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 what we lynch people in this part of the world. And in, in, in disgusting, generations gonna know, cause God is not gonna hold the truth. Cause w when it comes to a person, no matter what color skin they are. You can't hold the truth from people. You can't deny it. They're going to know that places from Illinois to Mississippi was racist. To all the way to the, to the West Coast was racist. That were Klan. They're going to know all this stuff. They're going to know all the lynchings. They're going to know everything. They're going to know that, that, that how the conspire of nations. They go to the other parts of the world. Conspire to cut us off as a nation. They're going to know. You can't stop it. Because if, the, if you can't stop the truth that coming, how we learn about ancient Egypt, and we know about ancient Rome, and we know about ancient Babylon, and we know about the ancient Europe, what makes you think you can, you can withhold the truth about what's going to happen to ancient America in another hundred years? However long America stands, even if it's, it comes down to ruins, 
somebody gonna come back in 150 years when we off this earth and, and be digging up the revenants and find out what the evil that it was in this land, the violence in this land, the injustice in this land. So you can never, never hide it. No matter, you, your children are gonna find out one way or the other. You know why? You, you know why? Because God is gonna tell the truth. God will reveal it to them. And it will be somebody, the curiosity, just like some we know history as we know today. What happened to these people? Why do you think they over there dicking up the land in Egypt trying to find out? Why do you think they over the land trying to dick up Israel? Why do you think they over the land and of Italy and other places? Because it's truth. And when they'll dig up the land in America, they'll find out about the sundown towns. They'll find out about the lynchings, the injustice. And they, and, they, and they said, why did they do this? Why were these people that evil? Why did they lynch them just based on the color of their skin? You can't hide the legacy. You won't be able to hide it no matter what your law makers say. You won't be able to hide it. Generations going to find out. And you and then the ones who, who make and pass these laws, you're going to stand before the God. And, and you're, going to, you're going to see during the time of the lynchings, the church bombings. You can't hide it no more. I don't care how many states banned it. Truth will come out. You can't hide it. Generations are going to know the evil it's, that was in the earth. When they come to age, they're going to know. The younger generation is going to know. So you can outlaw whatever you want to teach. You can get rid of the movies, the civil rights movies. You can do all that stuff. But you can't stop the truth. The monuments are there. The spears of the lynch people that have been murdered and lynched are there. They're there in the cotton fields of Mississippi, in the Everglades of Florida. They're there. And they're not gonna let they gonna not let you live. You, you're gonna have a haunting day. I promise you. Just like you snatched the bones out of Egypt and they haunting and then you brought the curse to America. Trying to show what's real over here. You brought judgment over here from Egypt. You brought from Greece. That's why we're in a spiritual. Because you brought the, Not only that you did that. You brought the spirits over here. Now you see the chaos. What we see today. Because you, because you don't respect life. That's what it is. America don't respect it. Western nations don't respect it. Like Germany, France, and America, and Canada, and other places. Therefore, that's why they pay, they're going to pay the price for what the evil deed that they done. Sneaking this canonic. You can you can kill off many people, cut them off on social media, kill them physically, mentally, spiritually, but you can't stop the truth. Many more people, it's like a fire. You can't stop this fire from coming of truth. Because it's going to spread like rapid fire. You can label people's conspiracy theories. You can label them, oh, you, you black walking, white, white washing, anything. But truth is truth. Deal with it. Deal with the truth. It's coming forth in all manner of fashions. <laughs> you can't stop the truth. You, you can you, you can, you can demonetize the channel but the, there's more people come with the truth there's more because once it's out there in, in the internet server in the world more truth is coming more truth is coming so what can you do once something's out there it's spread it's like it's like a virus it's just spread all over boom that's it so if a virus can spread from the east to the west and, and around the world what do you think the truth can do? If a fire can spread from east to west, what do you think truth can do? What do you think the, if a wind can, can spread from east to west, what do you think the truth can do? If the rains can and the snow can spread, what do you think truth can do? You can't stop the snow, you can't stop the rain, you can't stop the wind. You, you, you are not Elo, you're not the most high God. You can try to match it, but you'll never be it. No matter how intellectual superior you get, you'll never 
with being like that. You'll never be a god. Just because you think you're the highest high thinking being because of the complexion of history and, and paint the picture. You'll never have it ever happen. Alright then, ladies and gentlemen. Till next time, good food for thought. Take care.